Yeah, so the problem with ozone is that we were using these specific gases, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, in refrigerators, deodorants, a small subset of, of stuff that we used. And we got to the point where there was just basically a basic substitute. You could just take the CFCs out and put something else in in its place. And initially it was maybe a little bit more expensive, but it was kind of a one for one substitution within a really small number of goods. Mm -hmm. So once we did that, the problem was largely solved. The yeah. problem with climate change is like we literally need to change everything. We need to change the way we produce energy, um, the way we move around, the food we eat, um, the way we build stuff. Like it's a full economy wide problem. So I think that's part of the reason why it's so much harder. Yeah. What so, gives me, you know. Yeah. So uh, how's it going? What gives you hope? Um, we're still very far off track from where we need to be. But what gives me optimism that we have a shot of actually tackling this is we've actually made quite a lot of progress in the last decade. It sounds unbelievable, but we actually have. So we're currently on track for around two and a half degrees. That's kind of the median estimate of where our current policies are taking us. Now, that's very that's, bad. That's at global average temperatures relative to the long run. Average. Industrial, that's what, yeah. It's where we're going to end up. I mean, that's not where we are now, but that's where it looks like we'll Which, end up. Yeah, by the end of the century. Yeah. And is um, that bad? Sorry, sorry to ask the dumb question. No. Is that is that a problem? That's bad. That's really bad. Mm -hmm. um, we've set targets of trying to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees and well below two degrees, if not we won't reach the 1.5 degree target. We're going to go past 1.5 degrees. So in that regard, I'm not this like crazy optimist. Um, I think if you'd asked me a decade ago, I would have said two, two degrees was completely unfeasible as well. I'm becoming slightly more optimistic that we can get close to that range, although we're currently headed for 2.5. Yeah. And the reason for that and the reason I'm optimistic, and I think what maybe goes slightly against the quote you gave earlier is that I think if, it was true a decade ago that it was very expensive to tackle climate change, right? If you look at any of the technologies we need to switch to, so solar or wind or electric vehicles, they were all far more expensive than coal or gas or a petrol car. Yeah. So it really was like, are you willing to sacrifice the economy and put, put your money on the line in order to solve this? And a lot of countries just weren't. Yeah, I was talking um, to, just for context, I was talking to Schelling in 2005, he'd been writing about this problem since I think the 1970s. And, you know, as, a, as you say, as of 2005, that's solar? I mean, solar is just a pipe dream, right? It's, you know, it's, that's, not, that's not a real option, is it? But no. now it is. Yeah. Yeah, so over the last decade, the price of solar has fallen by 90%. The price of wind has fallen by 70%. Electric cars are starting to re reach price parity with a petrol car. Um, so your solar and wind are now the cheapest technologies we can we can put in, in instead of coal or gas. So I think regardless of climate change, many countries will actually just start to do this because it's the cheapest option. So I think we need to stop framing this as a, are you willing to sacrifice the economy in order to solve climate change because I think that's a false dichotomy and that's why I'm a bit more optimistic now than I was a decade ago. Yeah. Are you worried about um, solving the intermittency problem? Because batteries, I mean batteries are a lot cheaper but batteries don't solve everything. You know that the classic, you know, what happens at you know 5 30 in a December evening, everyone comes home, northern hemisphere, it's it, the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining, it's cold. How, how do you solve that problem with, you know, without burning carbon? So I think that it's a big challenge, but I think it's a solvable problem. Um, the, the, the intermittency problem is different on different timescales. So for, you know, evening out like peaks throughout the day on the basis of like hours, batteries work well. For longer term storage, you might be looking at other options such as hydrogen, or we're now talking about maybe methanol, like storing it as a liquid fuel, which mm -hmm. is, is easier than a battery over longer time periods. Um, so I think I think we will have a range of solutions at different time scales in order to balance that. And then I think that they are I think on the demand side, we'll actually just change things a lot. I think um, like a problem you might see is if we all move to electric vehicles, the problem you'll get is in the evening, everyone will come home, they'll start cooking, they'll turn on the heating, they'll start charging the electric vehicle. 
I think what you're going to get is a very different electricity system where pricing will often operate and, and go with when supply is highest. So you'll yeah. get really cheap electricity when the sun is shining or the wind's blowing. And I think we'll actually start to adapt to, to that. So you'll shift your electric car charging to a time when it's not peak demand, for example. Yeah.